Hello and welcome to the Analytics Show, the podcast of business through the lines of data science. But together, we'll dive into learning and sharing where various industries are heading and how data and analytics is at the heart of shaping business growth and productivity. Let's spark different ways of thinking about data and analytics that is relevant to you and prepare your business for future disruption. I'm your host, Jason Tan. I'm delighted you could make it on this journey with us. Hey guys, to continue to get support, tips, techniques, and tools, and learn from the expert, hit that subscribe button wherever you are so we can keep in touch and continue our lifelong learning together. So, are you using your company data to its full potential? Take our embedded analytic assessment, find out your score. A leading organization like Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google have moved beyond dashboard and embedded data science directly into their daily business operation. With our three-minute test, you will discover your potential in optimizing customer experience and revenue through embedded analytics. You will gain greater clarity, insight, and advice to embed analytics. Plus, you will receive customized results instantly. Find the link to this assessment in the description of this episode. Hi, Phil. Welcome to the Analytics Show podcast. I'm super duper excited to have you here today. Hey, mate. Thanks for having us. I'm very excited to talk to you here today. Thank you. Now, I'm going to start things a little bit light, especially I think some of these background that you have had in the past play a role in terms of what you are doing today. So I know you have a background in civil engineering and you had a PhD in hydrodynamic modeling as well as working in the engineering consultancy. Can you talk us through that early part of your career? Sure. And it's worth mentioning that it's it's the early part of the career, but it's also the foundation for where I've been to and, and what I'm still currently doing. You mentioned the word hydrodynamic. I find a lot of people are more familiar with the concept of aerodynamics, given the aviation industry, which obviously is sadly going through a bit of a tough time. And it's essentially the same. Aerodynamics is based on air versus hydrodynamics, which is based on fluids, in this case, water. And so my PhD was very much investigated in how does water work and particularly the modeling of that. So essentially, we build computer models that replicate the fluids that might happen in a, say, a dam or in the case of a flooding event. You know, obviously, you can imagine a lot of turbulence as it goes across bridges and stuff like that. So it's, it's building these models that can simulate what happens in the real world. And so that was what the theoretical side of what I did was. But obviously, I've always had a hunger for the application. So as much as I like knowing how things work, I love to see them then delivered in a way that can really impact society. And so then I did the next thing where I sold my soul, I suppose, and went into consultancy. And I worked as an engineering consultant for a bunch of years. And you might be familiar being up in Brisbane. There was some pretty significant floods there in 2010, 11. And uh, I was actually submitting my PhD and presenting a conference just after that. So it was a lot of opportunity and, and I was recruited to join a expert consultancy in Sydney. And there, what my primary role was very much building these models, making sure that, you know, things like if you are going to build a house, you know, what is your flood risk? If you have certain new big infrastructure projects, like say the Pacific Highway upgrade, which I participated in, in some capacity, you can imagine they cross a number of floodplains. Just making sure that we accommodate the fact that bridges have enough clearance so that water courses can still go. Carry out a number of levee designs, again, to protect communities from certain flood risks that we understand. And finally, also some dam break assessments. You know, God forbid it happened, but what happens if a dam breaks? What are design requirements? And so that was very much the first step of the application of my engineering and I guess, flood modeling skills. I think that, like I say, it's certainly a very important foundation of what you do, right? And my question then is, at what point did you decide to move into and work for an insurance company? Did that occur naturally or were you hit hunted? Look, it was, it was an interesting transition and it evolved from actually a conversation I had in the surf with a couple of mates that I knew that worked in the financial services. And as I mentioned, I was obsessed with this kind of thought of like, you know, the application of what you do. And when you look at, say, the company I work for, which is IAG in this case, 
When you look at the customers that have between Australia and New Zealand, that's over 10 million people that you can impact directly based on the models you can deliver. And so that became something that was very appealing to me. Can I build these models, but then have a distribution channel? And, and obviously, I'm, I'm pretty good at building things. My background is not sales. So, you know, it sounded like a pretty good idea to have this system where essentially you build insights and, and then you have this distribution channel per se through corporate Australia of impacting community. And that was a big idea behind, you know, that transition to an insurance in this case. I must say that one thing that I pick up from what you just say in terms of the distribution channel and uh, as an engineer, you build things and how it appeals to you that IAG or the corporate that you work for has already got that distribution channel to do all the delivering and the sales work. I thought it's fascinating as an engineer to think about it. So for the reason that I know that as an engineer, and I also know that working with many engineers, very often we don't spend enough time to think about the distribution and the sales side. And that is what tripping a lot of the startup as well. So I thought it's fascinating that how you were using that to your advantage and how you were thinking to, to incorporate that into your career. Did that come natural to you? And how did that whole thinking in terms of the distribution channel that help you with your engineering side? How did that happen? Sure. And look, the, the way the transition worked a little bit was I saw the, in this case, this insurance industry as a bit of a, its position as quite unique. So if you look at the world of engineering, which is really interpreting the real world environment, so that the physics of what drives a certain, in this case, natural disasters, but obviously engineering at the wider focus is, is really the physics of, of this world. While we've all heard of the fact that we say money or finance makes the world go round. And so I'm kind of like, well, what's that bridge between translating the physics into a financial mechanism? And it's not just that bridge. There's also the reality, which is as a big entity, and we mentioned this customer base, that you have this direct connection to the community. The communities are customers in this case. But also being so big, you have a very strong relationship with government because obviously government is very interested in knowing what you're going to do and particularly in the context of the fact that you can impact society. So you sit in this very sweet spot, I think, in this hybrid position of being able to align the, the physics, the finance, the community and the government that makes all the policies together. And, and that stitching and that position seemed really good. And it's something that I was able to obviously leverage a good bit of expertise on the side of the physics, but also then learn a tremendous amount of the three other facets to then kind of transition to the position where we're in a position to really, again, deliver some of those insights and leverage some of the mechanics that are already there as part of society. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Now, for our listeners who are from overseas, would you mind to share a little bit about your organization, IAG, and your role of the manager as a payroll pricing here? Yeah, yeah, happy to do that. IAG is the acronym behind Insurance Australia Group. It's the largest insurer in Australasia. We have a huge market share in, in Australia where we have 30% of the residential market, which is quite consolidated. But it's even bigger in New Zealand, actually, where we have over 60% of the residential market over there. And that's probably a good illustration of what we do for society or impact of society in, is how we got to that. So essentially... What happened in New Zealand was there was a very large sequence of earthquakes in 2010-11 around Christchurch. And unfortunately, it cost a tremendous amount. It cost over $40 billion, which is, I think, a significant portion of New Zealand GDP. And, and unfortunately, a number of institutions weren't sufficiently capitalized to pay on those claims. And so we were in a position where we, we were very well capitalized. And we're in a position to pay out on some of those claims and in the process acquire some of that market share and acquire some of that, some of those businesses. So that kind of put us in the position where we are now, where we have a, a very large position in both Australia and New Zealand. And obviously we do also have presences in Asia, much smaller in this case. But so essentially what we are is a insurer with a big market share in Australia and New Zealand and some market share in the Asia businesses. And you mentioned about the earthquake. I do remember about that vividly. I suppose the uh, earthquake is one of the natural that you cover here. Would you like to talk a little bit about your role as a natural payroll pricing role here and how it fit into the whole insurance pricing analytic side of the world? 
Yeah, sure. And look, maybe I'll start with what peril pricing is, which is essentially I talk about this conversion into a taking physical mechanisms and converting that into a financial cost. And that line of thought, if you think of the traditional kind of insurance products, the usual approach is you get a set of claims. Based on your claims, you then derive some relationships and you then extrapolate out and say, hey, based on historical claim, this is what I expect future claims to look like and then set a premium. Now, that's very effective for a number of things like theft and mortar, et cetera, with collisions and stuff where the behavior doesn't change substantially and you don't get those step changes. Now, what we see, and I'm going to, again, use another natural disaster that happened in 2011 to illustrate this, is, and, you might have, and I think many people have seen this, this huge disaster in Fukushima where a nuclear meltdown was created and the mechanics of it was a very substantial earthquake that caused a tsunami that then created a nuclear meltdown. Now, if you look at historical claims to inform that, you will never get that answer because it's never happened before, thankfully, in the history of the world. And so that's where the kind of the perils pricing from a kind of more engineering ground up view came, where we say, well, actually, what do engineers know and do? And, and the mechanics of plate movements that trigger these earthquakes is quite well understood. There's obviously tremendous uncertainty, but at the same time, there is a good view as to where this, these significant earthquakes can occur. Again, the fact that then they can propagate and trigger a tsunami that then has a an impact uh, far off from what have occurred is quite well known. Again, these models that we can build to propagate that wave across the ocean, in this case, to where it happened in Japan. And then we also understand the, the physics of the buildings that are there. You know? and, and so if the wave hits a building, we know what buildings were there, in this case, the nuclear power plant. And so we can then come to an understanding of, of what the impacts could be. And so that's where the kind of the ground up view of, of power pricing came versus the traditional view of using claims to do it. So that's what power pricing in a nutshell is. And our team is exactly that. It's, it's a composition of, of very diverse skill sets, a lot of experts in certain natural disasters that come together, a lot of IT and GIS experts as well, to build these models and then from there to then deliver insights into what that looks like in terms of potential financial costs. Now, I understand that in terms of the natural perils that your team and you cover, there's quite a few of them. So that include the bushfire, earthquake, and the flood that you mentioned before, cyclone, storm, and storm surge. Is that correct? And how would, how distinctive each of them you would say they are? Yeah, that's bang on. These are Australia's an interesting, and particularly Australia and New Zealand, but we have a lot of focus is an interesting continent because we get everything. And that's been demonstrated by the events just in the last few weeks where we had huge bushfires for the last two months in Fraser Island. And then just this week, we had huge rainfalls there that caused some significant flooding. And that just turned within the period of a week from bushfire to flood. And that's something we observe throughout the continent. And so, yes, we have bushfires, cyclones, earthquakes, floods, storm, and storm surge as the key perils. And if I was to kind of describe how we think about them, aside from the, again, the mechanics of how they occur, is through the lens of frequency by severity. And so what I mean is like, how often do they occur? And then when they occur, how bad is the impact? And so if you look at storm, for example, storm is something that we see many times a year. So it's a high frequency. And just about everybody in your audience will have experienced a storm, no matter where they are in the world. But the severity, thankfully, of these high frequency events tends to be pretty low. So you never get a full building being smashed on a regular basis when a storm happens. Now, if you look at the other end of the spectrum, which is more the bushfires that I mentioned or the earthquakes that we've been discussing at Atlanta already, they happen quite rarely, thankfully. You don't experience a large earthquake very often. But when they do, as evidenced by some of those devastating events we've discussed, the severity is really high. And so we really think about it in terms of that. What is the frequency of an event and what is the severity of this event? And there's a whole spectrum of them. And there's a whole interplay between small earthquakes happening a bit more often and big earthquakes happening less often. And that whole spectrum is what we look at. We do something where we integrate, we'll say, the severity by the frequency to give us an annualized view of that risk, which is effectively your premium. And then the key difference in the mechanics of those 
events and those perils comes down to how often they happen and how bad they are when they occur. In terms of the severity, if you don't mind, I want to develop that a little bit further. I'm curious to know, I think severity is one of those potentially of the black swan event, right? So would you do your stress testing every year, every few years to say, in the case of the magnitude of one of those natural peril event happen, how much of the impact would that in your portfolio um, and can the company afford to take on the amount of the risk that you have got in your portfolio? Definitely, that, that's a big part of what we do. And it's worth mentioning that there's seasonal variability, there's decadal variability, and, and, and it obviously there's just the whole fluctuation of whether a rare event can happen or not happen, right? But yes, a big part of what we do is we consider what are these extreme events that we think can happen. Uh, the bigger ones tend to be, again, earthquake in our case. Cyclone are very impactful as well, as you would know in Queensland. And so what we look at is, and they don't necessarily come as big surprises. They don't change year to year. But the fact that a big earthquake happening in Sydney or Melbourne would be very costly doesn't change from year to year. We understand that quite well. But it's again, it's it's how likely that is to happen. And there's ways to extrapolate that. So if we look at a significant earthquake that happened in Australia, which was the 1989 Newcastle earthquake. Now, that same exact earthquake happening in Sydney would be devastating. And, and there's no reason why, in terms of, again, the way the plates move, Australia's intraplate, there's no reason why the same earthquake can't happen there. And so we are in a position to go, okay, well, you know, based on this scenario, what does that look like in a really bad place like Sydney? And that's some of the decisions we use in informing the stress test that you mentioned, which we do have under our regulators like APRA, a regulatory requirement to investigate to make sure we have suitable capital collected. Now, at the same time, there's a limit to what we can cover, right? You can get these very, very extreme events. And we mentioned some of the business not necessarily having enough capital. There, there is a risk appetite where there's a reasonable part where we go, you know what, after this, it falls back onto a societal approach to how we can mitigate it because there's only so much you can protect against. So it's, it's an appetite between what can happen but also how likely it is to happen. And it's impossible to just go, okay, we're going to cover for everything that could ever happen ever, ever, because again, it would just be prohibitively expensive. Absolutely. Now, one of the thing, interesting approach that you take to the modeling of the natural disaster is that you both leverage the third party software as well as building your own internal model. Can you talk us through the why? Sure. And look, what we do is, I guess there's many tools, right? You can rely on something that's third party. You can rely on something that's internal. My preferred, and I think the most sophisticated way to go about it is understanding the strengths strength of both and taking a hybrid approach to it. And I'm, I'm kind of going to quickly delve into why I think that's the best way. We mentioned this whole frequency and severity between perils, right? And if we look at something like Storm, we have lots of data then there's no doubt in my mind that an insurer should leverage its internal claims to build its insights. It has a tremendous amount of insights, tremendous amount of data, so it should be in a position to build a very sophisticated model internally. Now, if you look at these rare events, and you might have noticed that I mentioned events in Japan, I mentioned events in New Zealand, there's obviously huge events in California when we talk about earthquakes. The fact is, they happen very rarely, thankfully. And so that means that if we were to just try and build an internal model, we'd be missing out on a lot of the information that happens on a global level. And so at that point, you want to leverage, in my opinion, external entities that have a more global footprint. But even breaking that down a little bit further, it's not just that you're going to go on a binary question, okay, for this peril, I'm going to use internal. For this peril, I'm going to use external. If I look at the composition of the model, we, we tend to view it in, in three distinct components. And the first is the hazard, which is, you know, the physical impact of something. So if you're thinking of an earthquake, it might be a shaking intensity. If you're thinking of a cyclone, it might be your wind speed. If you're thinking of flood, it might be your flood depth. If you're thinking of a bushfire, it might just be a fire intensity, for example. So that's the first layer and probably the most important layer. 
But then on top of that, once you've determined what an area is exposed to, the second part is, well, how does a, an asset, a building, respond to that? And so if you're thinking of, say, again, going back to a peril like earthquake, if you have a building that's made out of wood, for example, that has very good properties in an earthquake because wood is not tile, so it kind of bends without failing necessarily, versus if you had brick masonry, that's very brittle. So the same earthquake would crack the building and result in a significantly bigger impact. So then the second part is what we call the vulnerability, which is how does an asset exposed to the same hazard respond? And the final layer is your financial conditions. And that's simple. Is how valuable is the asset? What's the sum insured? Do you have deductibles, limits in place to mitigate some of those risks? But that interplay between the three means that if we come back to the example of, of collaboration, is we had a situation where the Christchurch earthquake put us in a unique position where we had a tremendous amount of data in terms of the vulnerability side of it. So how did buildings respond to certain losses? And again, New Zealand's an interesting market because it has a hugely high penetration rate of insurance. And that's because of mechanisms such as the ETC. Combined with, like I said, tremendous market share for a few players, which gives us a very good view of, of the full spectrum of, of assets insured. And the final one, which is the recentness of an event, which was 2010 11 in this case. And if you look at those three moving parts, it meant that we were sitting on one of the most complete data sets of losses for the, this particular mechanism, which was earthquake. And so in this case, we said, okay, well, we want to leverage one of the best global agencies, a company based out of Boston to deliver the actual hazard. But then we're going to work. And I was collaborating with them over in Boston in saying, okay, well, let's build our vulnerability insights into that and then overlay that with the financial conditions. And so that's a hybrid example of a model where we can kind of leverage the best of third-party software, which can be very powerful, as well as internal ability. And I think that hybrid solution is the key to a sophisticated that is fascinating to hear about the amount of step that you guys take to cover all of those things. Now, I know from experience that incorporating the natural peril into the pricing is a very intensive exercise, both from the data and processing power perspective. Given the impacts of the global warming, I could only imagine the frequency of updating the model is becoming more and more important and also more frequently than ever before. Does it introduce more challenge to your team? Absolutely. But I like challenges. I think it's what keeps what we do and exciting and it means we stay current with everything we do. And look, I think the trick or at least the approach we've taken is to be very modular as to what we build. So I've defined again a number of perils, a number of moving parts like hazard vulnerability exposure. Essentially, what we did was, like, if we look at flood, for example, which is one of the perils, and that has over a trillion cells of data. Now, that's a trillion cells of data, not just sitting in a computer. That is, like, interrogated and part of the live pricing process. So it's just a tremendous amount of data to deal with, albeit this is the highest peril. It's just one of the six perils we deal with, right? And so what we were able to do is, by having this modular approach, to then go, okay, well, we have a trillion cells of data, which is a hazard. We then have a number of layers of vulnerability on top of it, which is, again, rather than cross-multiplying, which is when you have the typical static approach, is already just sitting on top as a number of layers, then combined with another layer of, in this case, financial conditions. And the final approach in the case of climate change, which you mentioned, was to simply deploy a climate change module on top. So we were, instead of having the same data replicated over and over again for each climate change scenario or, in, or eventual impact, we were able to, because of the modular approach, simply have one set of data sets that was continuously built on. Now, the trick to do that is also to then move from a static calculation to a dynamic. And it has to be dynamic if you really want to leverage these solutions. And so if I was to summarize it as the two parts, is the first is to go, okay, make it modular. The second one is make it dynamic. And then the final thing is really building the right team to facilitate that. So if, if I look at the composition of the team, we have a number of actuaries, we have a number of engineers, which are the key skill sets in terms of building these insights. 
We also have GIS experts, front-end and back-end developers that leverage tools such as, well, the very just do a high-level tech stack, which is we tend to use Postgres databases with Python functions sitting on top and these service or APIs, service or front ends. And so by doing that and integrating a team with those different skill sets, we're able to develop these technical solutions that we're also considering the IT requirements at all time. Hey, y'all, I just want to give a quick shout out about this episode. It's sponsored by the Embedded Analytic Program at DDA. And the Embedded Analytic Program is designed for senior manager and executive in the business team who want to integrate data science into daily business operation and use it to drive customer experience excellence and revenue. A book unlimited strategy session for a full year and start embedding analytic into the business front line. For more information about this program, please refer to the description of this episode. Now let's get on back to the interview. Before I move on to the next question, I want to break it down of some of the things that you just say and highlight that to some of the more of the technical or perhaps more of the business people as well that what, what you just described in terms of the solution that actually covers so many component or layer as you described. And it's so important for all the different things coming together as an end-to-end solution that basically cover in terms of like the way of uh, how to manage the data and how to manage the data more efficiently. When you have a trillion records that you have to run and process, how do you separate the modeling and different calculation and the stat, all those sort of things sitting on top so that it doesn't chew up the processing power and also how you utilize the server in terms of putting all of those things together. I, I thought that it's just so much in there that is so worthwhile in highlighting. And it sometimes I think maybe people don't put enough thought in terms of managing all of those multiple components, but focus purely so much on the data science bit in terms of just building the model. And the expense of that is just that the solution doesn't become robust. The solution doesn't become agile and it becomes so rigid. As, and then they just cannot simply reuse the component, various components that they have built again and again, again. So uh, thank you so much in sharing that. And I thought I want to break it down <laughs> for some of the listener. Now, sure, and hopefully that helps. <laughs> it definitely helped. I, I thought that was really great. Now, I want to ask you this question, which is about the natural peril and the XY coordinate. I, I know there's a lot of books being done over there, and I always think that natural peril pricing is a lot more powerful when combined with the XY coordinate because it simply just allowed the insurer to move away from the zone level pricing to individual risk pricing. I would love the listener to hear your view on this. Yeah, definitely. And I mentioned that we have expertise on a team in GIS. And that's because when it comes to natural perils, it's all about where you are. And so when you mention X, Y coordinates, so this is your longitude, latitude, which is anytime you go on Google Maps and you click on something, it's generating, you know, where you located in space, if that makes sense. And it blows my mind because I still see some engines attempt to price natural perils, ignoring certain times just simply where you are on a location basis. And to illustrate why I find that really difficult to understand is because if we look at, say, the peril that we've been describing in this case, flood, you can be two properties side by side, and one of them is elevated because there's a hill, and the other one is less than 10 meters away but just down in the valley. And the risk differential can be absolutely enormous. I'm talking no flood risk versus tens of thousands of dollars of premium, potentially. And so that where is all important. And it's not just at that granular level, but if we look at, say, tropical cyclones, that obviously the whole word tropical cyclone comes from the fact that these Phenomenons originate in the tropics, in the, in the warm tropical waters. So they obviously have impact northern Australia as they develop their track downwards and they eventually hit the continent. Now, you will never get a cyclone, thankfully, hitting Melbourne. But then as you think of where you are, the further north you are, the more important that is. 
if you look at the phenomenon as well of where you are, it's not just where you are north, but it's also are you on the west side of Australia or you're on the east side of Australia? And to put that in context, WA, the largest and strongest wind speed ever recorded globally was off the coast of WA. It has some of the highest risks of tropical cyclones in the world. Now, the reason, and, and this illustrates nicely the impact of the confluence between exposure and, and risk, but what happens is if we had that same risk transplanted to Queensland and didn't really make a difference, we already know Queensland as a, as a high risk area for cyclone, but it is, and, and it is substantial, but it's still less than WA. And the reason why we have to be careful is if we then multiply that out by the fact that you have much more exposure, much more population in Queensland, we could significantly overestimate if we're uh, careful what the risk looks like for these areas where there's high population. And so the where you are is incredibly important. And that applies to all perils. I mean, if we look at the devastating bushfires that happened or kicked off in December 2019 last year and, and went on for a number of months, thankfully, Sydney, while affected by a lot of bushfire smoke, was never at risk itself to CBD or burning because it's not proximate bushland. Now, obviously, if you were in the Blue Mountains, you had tremendous risk of burning. So that location of where you are, again, is all important. And so as a result, yeah, absolutely. I think that the XY coordinate is your starting point, is the most important part of your consideration when you apply certain logic to pricing. And it should be your fundamental building block, in my opinion. Now, from the business perspective, would you share why natural Parallel pricing is important in the insurance portfolio management and how it benefits IAG? Sure. Well, look, the biggest benefit or need is simply the protection of the risk of ruin. So, so we mentioned some of these really big events. These runs into many billions of dollars. The bushfires, again, just last year were, were in the billions of dollars. If we don't adequately understand that, we're not in a position to be there for customers when the events happen. So the most important part of what we do is quantifying how big these risks are and how can we make sure we have solutions in place when these big events happen. And if we think of the principle of insurance, insurance is simply spreading risk, right? And the way that's in a company like ours is if we take, say, a premium for myself and some of my neighbors, then the odds of, say, a house fire happening, for example, is that, you know, one of the houses will be impacted and then all the other houses will be, so they can take the premium of many and pay out the single loss. Now, if we then extrapolate that out to, say, a big storm, now the big storm, as you would be experiencing just over the, the last few days, you might still be experiencing here, depending where you are in Queensland and New South Wales, that is likely to impact a much bigger footprint. So again, we understand that and we say, okay, well, we're going to mix that risk of say Northern New South Wales, and we're going to balance that out with risk we might have in New Zealand, or we might have in say Perth and other places that are not affected this specific system. But then it gets to a point where it's just too much risk in the same place. And again, coming back to that most important one I mentioned, which is earthquake. Like if an earthquake hits Sydney, we need to have a mechanism in place that spreads that risk outside of what we do. And that's called reinsurance. And essentially, it's just insurance for insurers. So in that case, we go, okay, we'll tap off insurance friend, reinsurance friends on the shoulder and go, hey, you guys have a global footprint. How about I take some of my Sydney earthquake risk and you then diversify that by balancing that with you know, California risk, but which might be earthquake in this case. It could be hurricane risk in Florida. It could be windstorm risk in Europe. And then they can then diversify their portfolios that if a big event happens in one of those places, they have the suitable capital to pay. So that's the first and most important thing we do. Well, the second thing is, is a mechanism which is risk-based pricing, which is what we've touched on and what my team does a lot of. And the reason that's important is because it sends a signal as to where the higher risks are. And right now, we're pretty fortunate. We see these many events, but thankfully, we tend to have very few properties located in high-risk areas. And so that, what that means is that if we have one property in high-risk areas, we might have 100 that are not. And so if something happens, you have 100 properties subsidizing the one property that's in a high-risk area. But now say we stop and we allow for a development that doesn't consider risk at all, then suddenly you might have 10 new risks in that area. And so you have 90 people paying for 10 people. 
Or if you continue down that route, you might have a situation where you might have 99 risks in high risk areas versus one risk in a low risk area. And suddenly everything becomes unaffordable. And so that consideration of pricing is very important and is the second part that we bring in to the equation. And the final one is just about understanding, is there a way to mitigate the risk once you're in a high risk area? Is there retrofitting options you can do to then make sure that everything becomes affordable for everybody, which is the ideal state we try and reach? So that's probably the top to bottom, the three kind of key functions that we perform for the business. I think one of the things that I find that extremely beautiful in terms of how you describe about the use of the analytic is the, the development of all of this insight. It's just not just about creating all of this insight and building the dashboard and building the reports and pass it on to the, the executive and pass it on to the business front line. But rather, it is about embedding all of this insight into the pricing and generate, embedding into the business operation already. And, and I think that is really a beautiful thing because what that basically means is that no longer all of this insight have to be sitting there to be interpreted and sitting there to be executed by whether it's the frontline or the executive. And I think that highlight the whole analytic philosophy in the insurance and put that in perspective. My question for you then is, do you think sort of uh, pricing philosophy or the analytic philosophy by embedding them into the business operation have started to become a bit more mainstream or are people still doing more on the dashboard thing? I think it's a great question. And I think you've got two moving parts that I'm not sure which one will win. And hopefully we get to that again, an optimal hybrid solution. But <laughs> what I find, and I love IT, I love technology, but what I see it as is a tremendously powerful tool. And I do emphasize the word tool. And so when you talk about pricing philosophy and stuff like that, something I observe that can happen and that we, I feel we should be very careful to do is we often, you know, define a tech stack and we build an IT solution. And then we go to all the use cases. You have to fit within the constraints of that IT solution. And I really try and turn that on its head. I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's have the real, again, First principle, fundamental issues. What is it? Is it a cyclone? Okay, where are you located? Dictates the IT solution. And that's why on my team, at least, we have a number of IT experts as part of what we do, which mix with, again, that insights from the engineering experts, the actuaries, and the GIS experts to say, okay, well, what's the best solution? Because, again, the pricing philosophy, in my opinion, is to, to make sure that we view the engine as a tool and the expertise as a thing that drives a tool rather than the engine driving the expertise and saying, you know, based on these constraints, we essentially can't do what you're trying to do. Wonderful. Now, moving the subject to global climate change, I think the plastic bag ban is a good example of the good environmental outcome when corporation and government works together, given that the extensive knowledge of the insurers that you have in terms of the natural perils. What roles do you think insurers can play in working with the government um, so we could inch closer to the Paris Agreement? Now, I want to highlight that this doesn't necessarily represent the position that IAG, but this is merely just to hear a little bit of your personal opinion. Sure, and I think this is the challenge that's going to define our times, in my opinion. But like anything, and I said it earlier, I think challenges are exciting. You know, big part of what gets me excited when I wake up is what are these big problems that we can try and find really sophisticated solutions to? And so when you mention government and corporates, I think we have to make sure we don't forget the third really critical pillar of this, which is the community. When you align those three pillars, then you, that's the only thing that's going to drive this systemic changes that's needed to address these huge challenges. And the biggest challenges, in my view, is not necessarily one of the pillars individually. I think government agrees we should do something. I think corporates agree we should do something. I think the community certainly has taken sometimes leading roles in showing that they want to do something about it, say, for example, installation solar. But the alignment between the three and the pragmatism that needs to follow, I think, is the biggest challenge that we can contribute to. And so where we started at is the first bit, I think, is communication. 
And so if I were to look at what IG has done just recently in the last week, going back the last four weeks in terms of releases, we've released a number of fact sheets defining what is bushfire, how does it work, what can you do to protect yourself? We've done the same for flood. We've done the same for tropical cyclone. And the first thing is a communication tool to say, hey, guys, just so you know, there's a tremendous amount of insight that sits there. And here it is in a way that's hopefully digestible so that we can kind of get on the same playing field, if that makes sense. Now, that's the first step. I think the second step, once you align it, and that's where it gets exciting, like a fact that I'd like to highlight is that when we talk about climate change, we're talking about future. Now, it is present, and we are saying, unfortunately, impacts every day. Now, it's also important to mark that not everything we see is down to entirely climate change, but there's certainly a signal already being observed. But when we talk about the future, if we, if we look at the Paris climate change goal, which is 2050, 40% of houses that will exist in 2050 in Australia are not built yet. So simply by choosing where we build and how we build, we can significantly mitigate against the impacts of climate change. That's something that we are increasingly playing in and, uh, and something that I'm personally very passionate about. And the final thing is how can you mitigate the actual climate change itself rather than just the impacts? And so personally, I, again, I feel quite strongly about it. I have a startup, which is called Solar Science, which looks at all the tools that we can apply to basically in increase solar penetration, but also kind of balancing with the fact that these are not panaceas. You can't just go, hey, let's install a heap of solar and all our problems will go away. The reality is, you know, the timing of where that production happens is all important. The place, we talk about diversification in insurance, the same principle applies with the energy market. If you have everything in solar and the sun is shining, fantastic, but then you get a few storms like we've had the last few days, and the whole system and the whole consumption equation goes and potentially falls over. These are the type of steps that I feel very passionate about that we've already taken, but again, actively undertaken as well. And again, it comes back to that alignment between the community and I sense real strong will to do that. And I think the next stage is again, alignment with governments and alignment with the corporates, which obviously have between the three of them a big, big, potential for the change thing. And one of the things I like to think about, and it was quoted, I should have a disclaimer, this is not my own quote, but with climate change, you sometimes see this thing of going from denial to despair and missing the middle bit, which is, okay, this is hard challenges. We have really, really smart people with really, really good solutions potentially available to us and opportunities to change things in a way that's cleaner for the environment and better for the future. That is a great take about that whole thing. Really like it. Unfortunately, it's not mine. <laughs> I'm sure you have some good thinking in that. <laughs> now, that almost brings us to the end of this interview. And uh, these are the usual two questions that I ask every single of my guests. What is your most important first principle? Sure. Look, my, and I think there's many important principles, but the first principle, ironically, is this whole try and break down things down to the first principles of, of what they make up in terms of the problem. And again, it comes back to the reason why is once you understand how we got to certain examples and situations or processes, once you understand the first principles of what drives it, whether it's physics, whether it's you know a community requirement, whether it's a government policy, then you can really start reinventing the parts that need reinventing. And the reason I say the parts that need reinventing is because if I look in, and obviously I have many friends on myself exposure in the startup community, I think the startup community is a brilliant engine for innovation, but sometimes it does it at the cost of ignoring some of the really good insights that exist from like say large corporates or large entities or large fields of expertise that have hundreds of years of experience. The insurance industry has been around for many, many hundreds of years. But then on the flip side, you can't let a process that exists for hundreds of years be just set in stone because it's existed for 100 years. And so that hybrid solution between the two moving parts is, is what I think it can create some really brilliant solutions. But it comes back to break down things to first principle. Why did a, a existing process engine thing exist? And what are the things that are still very relevant, but then what is not necessarily relevant anymore? And, and that's kind of that. Break it down to first principles first. Love it. My next question is, what is one book that you have read and thought it would have been better for your younger self to have? 
<laughs> well, look, one book I, I read that I really like, and mostly because I'm biased and he's a big inspiration of mine, is the Elon Musk story. And and the reality is, and we talked about first principles, that's very much how he looks at things. You know, what are the first principles in terms of physics of, say, rocket science that makes it possible to do certain things and divide it? So that's a book that I very much enjoyed. I guess I would have really liked to have read it when I was younger, simply because if I'd read it early enough, I might have decided to invest in Tesla. And I think if I'd invested in Tesla just before it started exploding in 2012, I'd put in, say, $10,000, I'd be worth well over a million dollars now. So that would be something that younger Phil would be very happy to have <laughs> had insight into, <laughs> to the benefit of today's Phil. I thought you were going to tell me that uh, should you have read it in your younger cell, you might decide to become a rocket scientist and build the rocket and take us to the Mars instead. <laughs> it's funny because that is a very true thing. And some things I, I call out to my stakeholders, which is I, people always say, oh, this might be too big or a bit too ambitious when you come up with ideas and turn around and say in all humility, and it's like, look, guys, this is not exactly rocket science. And even then, you know, now that we have commercially made successes out of rocket launches, I think that even if it were rocket science, we should be able to do it and apply it to a business. So <laughs> I'm certainly not a rocket scientist. I'm not in the same league as them, if I, if I was to be totally honest, but who knows? <laughs> Exactly. I think uh, thinking about everything is possible is super important. And Elon proved to us that it is entirely possible to build a rocket in one tenth of the cost by a private company. That is just amazing, isn't it? Now, thank you. So oh, it's incredible. <laughs> Phil, for sharing this uh, wisdom and experience in terms of the pricing and the insurance analytics, especially in the area of the natural power, I think that is really benefiting a lot of people to understand about how to embed the analytic into the uh, business process. Thank you so much. My pleasure. That was really fun. And yeah, hopefully some of that was helpful. And look, I've been listening to a few of your podcasts and I've gotten a lot. So hopefully a few people can get half what I've gotten out of some of the talks. Thanks very much for having me. Hello. If you enjoyed this conversation, hit the subscribe button so we can meet again. If you don't, I'll be stuck in an infinite loop. So pull that part by clicking the subscribe and help me out. You can further support us by leaving us a kind review from wherever you are listening. At the end of the year, I will choose a reviewer to send a special gift to, and it might just be you. I look forward to seeing you here next week for a new adventure. If I can find my way out of this endless loop. See ya!